welcome everyone. Uh, looks like it's three o'clock um, and people are still logging in and that's okay. I have a few slides to go through before we get to the good stuff anyhow. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, so welcome everyone to the July monthly meeting of the Committee on Increasing Diversity in the US Ocean Studies Community. This is one of a series of monthly meetings that we're holding, um, aiming to chip away at the committee's information gathering needs between our larger two-day meetings. I'm Kelly Oskvig. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a senior program officer for the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academies, and I'm the study director for this study. Um, so over the next several months, uh, we'll be using our open sessions to learn more about a few programs in ocean studies and in STEM in general, that have been particularly successful increasing um, di diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field. So today we'll hear about two programs that have been successful in the K through 12 space. Um, but before we dig in, I do have a few quick slides to talk through um, in case we have anyone joining us who's unfamiliar with the study or the academies. Um, um, so first, established by President Lincoln, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, referred to as NASM, are nonprofit organizations with a mission to provide evidence-based, unbiased advice on matters of scientific importance to the nation. NASM produces more than 200 reports a year annually, as well as completes a number of other types of convening activities, calling on over 6,000 volunteer experts a year. The work is generally funded by the government. Um, some are legislatively mandated, some are commissioned by an agency, and some, like this one, are developed by our wonderful Ocean Studies Board members. Um, we also work for nonprofit institutions and industry or any organization that is specifically looking for objective and independent advice. Um, next slide. Uh, a few but very important notes on engagement in today's session. Um, the National Academies are committed to the principles of diversity, integrity, civility, and respect in all our activities. And we're looking to everyone here to be a partner in this commitment by helping us maintain a professional and cordial environment. Um, as a committee, we're also committed to creating a safe, inclusive space that fosters belonging. Um, we do understand that we might not always get that right, um, but we're committed to improving and learning how to best conduct inclusive meetings, and we welcome your feedback and suggestions. And if there's anything um, that we can do right now to make the meeting more inclusive for you, please do send me a note in the chat. Um, for today, I'd just like everyone to please introduce yourself the first time you talk with your name and affiliation. Uh, please do mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, and please use the hand raise function to ask a question. Um, anyone online is welcome to ask questions, and we'll um, we'll call on them in the order of hands raised today. Uh, next slide, please. So the project overview, this is a 24-month consensus study. And by consensus study, um, the, the, the report that we it goes through peer review and that we publish is authored by the full committee. Um, and so the full committee is you know, backing those recommendations and conclusions included in that report. Um, we have four sponsors for this study. Um, we have the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Office of Naval Research, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Science Foundation, who are very grateful um, for coming on board to, to sponsor this important work. Um, we have 15 volunteer expert committee members um, working on the study. Um, many of them are online right now. And uh, to do this work, we have four uh, hybrid two-day meetings. And then we also have monthly virtual meetings, which is what today is. So this is our, our July monthly virtual meeting. Um, we have both open or public sessions like this one where anyone is um, most welcome and encouraged to join. And then we also have closed sessions. Um, and I think my earbuds just died, so I'm gonna switch. Uh, hello? Can you guys hear me? Okay, sorry, I just got the... Found. Um, okay, so um, we also have closed meetings, which are just committee and staff only, kind of for deliberations and writing of the report um, and kind of development of those conclusions and recommendations. Um, and all of this will lead to a peer-reviewed published report released in the summer of 2025. Uh, next slide. 
So here you have our statement of task. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, um, but we'll put a, a link in the chat if you want to um, explore this further. Um, really, this, this committee is trying to identify evidence-based approaches for systemic change to increase racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity and inclusion in the Ocean Studies workforce. Um, we're doing this through examination and collection of existing narratives um, from ocean enterprise professionals um, that have been representing historically excluded groups. Um, we're doing this by analyzing policies and strategies and practices of current and existing programs. Um, we're aiming to develop you know, a coordinated strategy that um, really relates to all the elements of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and justice. And um, of course, we're identifying metrics to evaluate progress. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's a list of um, our 15 awesome committee members. Um, uh, their bios are online, so the link that was just posted in there, you could click on committee members and read more about each of them. Um, next slide, please. So here is our general project timeline. Um, this whole pro project kicked off um, in the fall of 2023. Um, it looks like we're about halfway through, but it also feels like we just got started. Um, we have had two of our four meetings already. Um, we're working up towards another very large um, information gathering meeting in October of this year, and then our final meeting will be in February of next year, and that's really just a writing and a closed committee meeting. Um, and then we'll go into peer review in the spring of 2025, releasing um, a PDF version of our report at the end of May, and then kind of a nice, glossy, um, polished report at the end of the summer. Um, next slide, please. And we encourage everyone online um, to please stay up to date with the progress of the, the study. Um, we'll put, I think this link is also in the chat. If not, I know Safa will put it in there. Um, this is a way that you can keep up to date with what we're doing, and you'll get announcements of upcoming meetings, registration links, um, and things of that nature. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, to the good stuff. Um, so first up, um, we have Jill Zand. She's the Executive Director of the Marine Advanced Technology Education, or MATE, ROV competition with the Marine Technology Society, where she established the Global Student ROV Competition and coordinated the development of MATE's underwater robotics, um, science design, and fabrication textbook. Both of these involve cultivating and maintaining partnerships with industry, professional societies, academic institutions, and STEM professionals. Still has a bachelor's degree in biology from Penn State and a master's in oceanography and coastal sciences from Louisiana State University. Um, Jill, I'm going to hand it over to you. I think you are sharing your screen today. Okay, I can do that. Hold on real quick. I wasn't sure. I'm just going to get... Oh, it's up to you, whichever you prefer. Um, you know what? If you have them and could share and don't mind me um, asking you to drive, let's let's do that. Sure. Thank you. All right. I appreciate that, Kelly. Sure. If we can start start at the beginning, that's the last slide. So if we can get to the beginning of the slideshow, that would be fantastic. And, and I just want to say, um, while, while you're getting to the start, thank you for the opportunity. I, I very much appreciate um, being here. And as I look at the list of committee members and the participants online today, I see a number of familiar names, uh, including a longtime MATE ROB competition volunteer and colleague, George Matsumoto, who could deliver this presentation himself at this point, I think, but but you've got me instead. I also want to give a little shout out to Lisa Rome from um, NSF, a longtime supporter and, and colleague. It's it's good to, to be with you all again today. Um, so yes, this, this is MATE. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, and thank you, <laughs> George. Um, so I wanted to give you a bit of background about MATE to give you an appreciation of our roots our journey and where we have landed. So the journey began. Um, we were the Marine Advanced Technology Education Center, established in 1997 via a grant from the NSF ATE program. ATE is Advanced Technological Education Program. It's a workforce development program that focuses on two-year community and technical colleges. 
And that grant was given to Monterey Peninsula College. And again, in 1997 was when the Mate Center was established. 19 years later, um, the principals and the leadership of, of the Mate Center created Mate Inspiration for Innovation, or Mate 2. Um, we founded that as a 501c3 nonprofit incorporated in the state of California. And the goal there, as you can see it on the screen, was to su support and sustain ongoing education activities initiated by the Mate Center. And just over a year ago, on July 1st, 2023, Mate, we started the next phase of its journey um, and integrated with the Marine Technology Society, or MTS. MTS is a professional society. It's an umbrella society for ocean professionals, engineers, technicians, technologists, innovators, academics, academics um, and folks from government agencies. So really proud and wonderful to um, have be in a situation where I, I feel we have found our, our forever home with, with MTS. Next slide, please. Very appropriate that we are now part of MTS because we um, created the Mate ROB competition in partnership with MTS, specifically the MTS ROV committee back in the early 2000s. You can see there on the screen, it was created as a workforce development pipeline to raise awareness of ocean related careers and to help students develop the skills necessary to support and sustain ocean activities. And I wanna apologize, this slide is very text heavy, but it was my effort to try to summarize at a high level, all that is the Mate ROV competition, get it all on one slide in the interest of time and anticipation that this presentation might be shared without remarks or commentaries. So um, again, apologize for, for all the text on this slide, but continuing to work through it um, currently, the competition includes a world championship and a network of 48 events that take place across the country and around the world. We are growing, especially in the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa, and in the Asia, Southeast Asia, ASEAN um, region of the world. The competition requires students to work in teams to engineer and operate ROVs and floats too, and we'll talk about that in just a bit, to tackle tasks based on real world scenarios, real world challenges, real world issues. Um, we also challenge students to think of themselves as entrepreneurs and, and we emphasize a business approach. So we challenge the students to transform their teams into companies, think of themselves as a startup company and to organize in that way, really trying to give them a sense of the business, develop a business acumen. In addition to the robot, the ROVs and the floats and, and the sensors and the tooling needed to accomplish the tasks, the students also prepare technical reports, they deliver engineering presentations, and they prepare what we call marketing displays or poster displays that are delivered to working professionals who volunteer as judges. And certainly want to emphasize the importance and the gratitude for all of our volunteers, including George um, and the many others who contribute to this. We are definitely um, a volunteer uh, heavy uh, program and we couldn't do and couldn't have gotten where we are with our, uh, without um, the dedication and devotion of our volunteers. So in addition to the competition, it includes the, the program, overall program includes professional development workshops, instructional materials that are aligned with next generation science standards and other technology education standards. We have our CMATE starter ROV kits to help uh, teams get over that, that barrier to participation, get over that hurdle of how to get started and where to get started. Um, we have building guides and much more to support student learning. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm, I'm going to get in a little bit. The next two slides are going to cover the community that we serve. Um, so this is our, our competition team participation chart. You can see our journey from 2001. You can see the falling off of the cliff with the pandemic, no events, no program in 2020. I know that's no surprise. And then our slow rebuilding. Um, I wish that we were rebuilding at a faster rate than we are. Um, there's a number of factors that um, influence that, and that's a conversation for another day. But we are steadily increasing the building back, rebuilding back to our pre-pandemic numbers. 
Um, I mentioned we are global. We serve a K through 16 community. So if you'll remember at the start, we were founded by the ATE program NSF, which focuses on community and technical colleges. We built the competition with that audience in mind, but when we built it, they came, they being middle and high schools. And so we knew that was an opportunity. We went back to NSF and got an ITES grant, Innovative Technology Experiences for Students and Teachers grant. That program is a fantastic complement to the ATE program. And it was funding through, we had two ITES grants back to back, and that's what really helped us to develop and support our K through 12 program. Um, if you look at this chart, others, you might be asking yourself, what, what are others? Others are things like boys scout troops and girl scout troops and boys and girls clubs, homeschools, other community-based organizations, students working in their parents' garages that, that come together in four teams. So that's what falls under others. Um, next slide, please. And let me know. I'm happy. I, I, I don't know the format. If you want me to take questions now or save questions at the end, you can see my presenter's notes up there for additional um, for additional narrative. But let me know if you have any questions now or again, if you want to save them to the end. Um, no, no problem there. So let's dive in a little bit to the demographics. This is a look. This is 2020. Just finished the competition season with the World Championship last June. So this is hot off the press, our demographics for 2024. Um, taking a look at this, and I, I do want to point out that we define diverse, diversity very broadly. Uh, socioeconomic status, uh, gender, ethnicity, even geographic location, <laughs> Midwest, rural, um, migrant population. So we have a broad definition of, of diversity here. Um, you can see the data. Um, I will point out too that the location of our regional programs absolutely influences influences these numbers, as you can imagine. And I encourage you, I didn't include a chart of all of our regional programs across the country and around the world, but you can find that on our website. And that link is at the end of the presentation. Um, you can see 36% white or Caucasian, uh, no data, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, Asian, Middle Eastern, given the fact that we have five, soon to be six regional programs in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, ASEAN countries, and um, three going to soon be four competitions in the MENA region, Middle East, North, Northern Africa. That shouldn't be surprised at those numbers. Um, and taking a look at at gender here, you can you can see the breakdown. And I'm actually a little disappointed in those numbers, to be honest with you. Um, they have uh, we've we've a bit. We've regressed a bit um, post-pandemic, pre-pandemic, the uh, just overall um, breakdown of male to female was more 60-40. So, so we have work to do there. Um, but I do want to point out, and, and you can see the note up there, in 2024, we modified both the ethnicity and the gender response selections with notable results. Um, in 2023, we had 70% of our students opt out of reporting on their ethnicity. Uh, in 2024, you can see that percentage is, is more at 20%. Um, similarly, with our, our gender responses, so point being, um, when we offered more inclusive categories, we got more of a response, and, and I don't think that should be any surprise to this group. Also want to note that um, starting several years back, many years back, actually pre-pandemic, pre our evaluator started using zip codes as proxies for socioeconomic status. We didn't specifically ask if they came from a Title I school. We were considering doing that moving forward. So she used zip codes as a proxy for uh, socioeconomic status. And consistently, we had over 32% of student participants come from what we defined as high poverty areas. And, and in some cases, pre-pandemic, we had over 40%. So I just wanted to, to point that out and share that. Um, next slide, please. All right, talking a little bit about impact, um, certainly important to measure the impact of the program. We measure impact and have since the very beginning via post-competition surveys that we offer up to our student participants. We also uh, survey parents, 
mentors and volunteers for the students. We ask things like um, their, uh, as a result of participating in the competition, has it increased their interest in STEM, in ocean STEM, in STEM careers, um, ask them for their uh, reflections on uh, skill improvements. Have they increased their, their, a lot of what we focus on are their employability skills, their leadership, their critical thinking, their problem solving. We ask similar questions of parents and teachers, and, and this should probably come as no surprise that oftentimes, many times, the majority of times, parents and teachers rate their students' progress higher than the students do themselves, which is, which is interesting and what prompted us to ask parents and teachers those same questions. Um, I'm focusing here on our alumni survey. So we um, have surveyed our alumni. We The first alumni survey we did was in 2015. We did in 20, another one in 2020. And those results are high level results, summary results are presented here. And next Thursday, I'm looking at the date here on August 1st, we will launch our third alumni survey. So really the, the goal of this survey is to um, get a sense of the impact that the competition has on students' education and career choices. And so you can, you can see the data there. Um, I'm gonna call your attention to the 88% of college degrees for STEM degrees and 83% of college students for STEM majors. We don't have granular data on how many of those are ocean related degrees or ocean related majors. And I think you can appreciate that that can be challenging because of the, the lack of, for example, specifically ocean engineering programs, rather those ocean engineering, for example, is a focus area or concentration under a broader engineering program. Um, I'll also point out the 77% of employed alumni had a STEM related job. In 2015 and 2020, we did ask specifically if they had, were in an ROV related job now or had ever been. Um, I realized at the time that made sense to be that specific, but I realized we should have been more broader. And so we're remedying that in the survey that will launch next week. And instead that question, a follow on question to, are you employed in a STEM related job will be, are you employed in a job that has to do with ocean science and technologies? So we'll get a little bit more deeper dive and, and data there. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, I don't believe I've said this all already, um, but I, I want to point out that we, um, as one of our longtime volunteers said, we are a diverse program, a diversity program without being a diversity program. We didn't set out to create the competition with an eye at diversity in mind. That wasn't a stated goal. It was really a workforce development pipeline and platform. Um, so with that in mind, looking at our numbers, um, we could do better, especially when it comes to, to gender equity. And I wanted to share with you some examples of the work that we're doing, some grants that we have, some donor funding that we have that are specifically aimed at increasing uh, diversity in the ocean and greater STEM workforce. We have funding from the Schmidt Ocean Coalition, Tennessee Valley Robotics, which serves the Tennessee Valley Authority um, area, which includes Appalachian Highlands um, and some socioeconomically depressed areas. Motorola Solutions Foundation, Honda Foundation, and MITRE Corporation have all contributed funding grants and, and donor funding. Um, primarily, this money has gone to support professional development workshops, which are part of our, our pathway to team development. And thus far, the, the leading indicators are, are fairly positive. Um, this year, we have uh, led, offered six professional development workshops for teachers since December. We've done six with more to come. We have one that's coming up next week in Minnesota, another one in September in Halifax, Nova Scotia. But you can see on average thus far, 88% of the professional development workshop participants um, uh, indicated that they support students from underserved or underrepresented communities. So we are excited about, we're, we're grateful for this funding from these um, particular organizations and, and look forward to, to presenting updated results as we carry out more of these professional development workshops, which translate and convert to teams, which will then translate into student data that I can share with you at, at a later date. 
Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned floats earlier. So in addition to incorporating float related mission tasks into our ROB competition, we also created Mate Floats Marine Technology Summer Workshop. You can see from, from the slide there, it's an advanced immersive multi-day multi learning experience around float technology, sensors, and data science. Um, I'm thrilled I'm partnering with, with George on this. Uh, this particular program that's Summer Marine Technology Camp leverages several grants and partnerships that we have. Um, the GOBI GC Float Array, NSF funded grants um, with Imbari as a lead organization. It also pulls in funding that we have from the National Center for Autonomous Technologies or NCAT. NCAT is another a center funded by the Advanced Technological Program, the ATE program at NSF, with the goal of developing and supporting the air, land, and sea autonomous technology workforce. Um, it also leverages the grant that I have, um, another ATE grant to increase community college participation in the MADE ROV competition, even though that's where we started those those were our roots and that was our intention. That audience was our intended audience for the competition. Over the years, those, those team participation numbers from community colleges have not increased. And so we're, we're doing something about that. And certainly um, it leverages our longtime partnership with the University of Washington and a number of, of colleagues that we have there. Um, the workshop target audience is community and technical college students across the US. Um, you all likely appreciate that community colleges serve a very diverse population, broadly defined diverse population of, of students. Um, and these are students and institutions that don't always have access to these types of opportunities. So we had our first Mate Floats workshop last summer. I didn't um, incorporate results into this presentation in the interest of time, but we have our next one coming up, actually the week of August 5th. This will be our second go round. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I wanted to, to leave uh, you with some, some parting thoughts here. Um, the cornerstones of MATE programs, uh, accessible to a wide and diverse audience, provide opportunities for networking and facilitate connections with employers. Um, I hope you took that from, from the brief presentation. And I want to uh, kind of um, dive into this last comment that I have here, albeit it's difficult to make those connections when no one from the industry shows up. At our regional coordinators meeting that we held, um, one of our longtime regional coordinators who is um, just really fantastic individual. He said specifically, I'd love to make the regional competition a bit more educational in terms of marine engineering, especially, but that's hard to do when no one from industry shows up. And I think that really emphasized the importance of volunteers, people in those careers, organizations offering those jobs, being part, volunteering, and showing up at these types of events and these types of programs. Um, another wonderful longtime volunteer pointed out that oceans aren't confined to the coast. I think we all can appreciate that. And certainly our programs reach inland via our regional competitions, our NCAP partnership with it, which is giving us a whole other network of community and technical college students and partners to communicate with, and our involvement with the GOBGC grant. Um, I'll just offer this up to um, something to consider, uh, a strategy not necessarily to create new programs, unless certainly your conversations that you're having with ocean enterprise professionals who represent traditionally marginalized and underrepresented groups identify specific gaps. But rather, again, rather than new programs, support and strengthen programs that have the reach, this culture of inclusivity, demonstrate impact and the potential to demonstrate even more impact with additional support. And support is not always about funding, in-kind support and creating and leveraging the partnerships can be a win-win for all. Um, and I think we, we've had that experience in our journey as MATE and with the ROB competition and uh, welcome additional partnerships and, and in-kind support, including volunteers. Again, can't emphasize how much volunteers are, are critical to our programming. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, the last word, I put this in there, and this is, I apologize, it really is an inside joke, but for those of you um, on this call who know Rick Rupan or have ever seen him in action as the MC of the live broadcast from our world championship, um, if you've seen that, you you this makes sense to you because Rick is famous for, for grabbing the microphone from me or others to, to get in the last word with all good intentions. This is something he shared recently. We were part of a conversation a, a, about a grant proposal. Um, and this is something that, that he said, and I'm gonna share again, he's a longtime volunteer ocean industry professional and just emphasizing the point about strengthening, strengthening these programs and making sure to make those connections between the students and the career professionals and the organizations and individuals offering the jobs. All right, I have one one more slide and then then I'm done. Um, but as, as typically happens at the World Championship, I always get in the last word. And so I'll just offer this up to you. This is one of my favorite photos of all time from a World Championship competition it's from our 2018 competition that took place in Seattle. And I just love this image. It shows beautiful colors, beautiful ROVs and, and beautiful diversity. And so um, with that, I'll leave you with that. And, and I don't know if there's time for questions or what the format is, but again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Yeah, thank you so much, Jill. Um, I loved everything about that. Um, I, I imagine there are several questions, but I do wanna make sure we have plenty of time to get through. So as, in the interest of time, I do wanna move on to the next one and then we'll go back to the questions. Sounds good. Um, I see some I see some clapping, but I don't see any hands raised yet. So thank you so much. Um, so next we have Melissa Broger. Did, did I say that right, Melissa? Broder. Yeah. Oh, Broder. Thank you. <laughs> she is a program manager of the National Ocean Sciences Bowl, or NOSB. She works to educate the next generation of ocean scientists and stewards by managing and leading NOSB's many activities. Melissa received her BS in, uh, mass in marine biology from Fairleigh, Fairleigh Dixon University and her master's in earth sciences and oceanography from the University of New Hampshire. Um, Melissa, I'm not sure if you're sharing your slides or if we are. Um, the if you could, if you could, floor is yours. would be fantastic. Great, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, All right, thank you, Melissa. Sure. Well, thanks for having me today. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to tell you about the National Ocean Sciences Bowl and some of our diversity related initiatives uh, to engage students from underserved communities. So I'm Melissa. I've been with the NOSB since uh, 2011. Um, so obviously, I find working on this program um, fun, but also very rewarding, as we know that bringing ocean science education to students across the US is really important. Um, since October 2022, the NOSB is now housed at the Center for Ocean Leadership, which is a community program of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Next slide, please. So I think a few of you on the call um, have some experience with the NOSB, but for others who might not be familiar with the program, I thought I would just go through a quick breakdown. Um, so the NOSB is a fast paced, uh, ocean Science Quiz Bowl competition for high school students. We were also created in 1997, um, just like me. Um, our annual participation includes on average about 2,000 students from 325 schools in up to 36 states. And I'm very happy that consistently we have a 50-50 split between female and male participants. Each team can consist of up to five students and they compete as a team from their high school, their home school or an after school group or club. Um, honestly, we simply try to make it as easy as possible for interested students to participate. So any way that they can form a team, we'll accept them. Typically there is a teacher at their school who serves as the coach and point of uh, contact, but we actually have so many teams that are highly student driven that they may just have a parent or another member of their community sort of serve as that adult figurehead. We also rely very heavily on volunteers to support all aspects of the program. And we have a, on average about 1500 volunteers per year, many of whom have been with the program for 10 plus years, some who have been with us all 27. And we also have many program alumni that come back each year to volunteer. And these volunteers, you know, they serve in multiple roles, either as room officials, career mentors, they may provide activities or field trips, maybe speakers. 
But really the real goal of having the volunteers um, engaged is that no matter how they assist the program, they're actually helping to encourage students to achieve career goals to which they aspire. But we also like to say that while the students are drawn to the NOSB because it is a fast paced academic competition, we are much more than a competition. The program engages students uh, to pursue ocean science further and show, shows them that there is a wealth of opportunities for future careers in the field. And we're training the next generation of ocean science, policy, research, technology, and education leaders, but not just in scientific knowledge, but also in skills, including self-conducted study and research, collaboration, teamwork, thinking fast on their feet, and public speaking, all of which, you know, these skills will assist them in their college studies, future careers, and even their personal lives. We do place a very large focus on career mentoring. One of the unique aspects of the NOSB is that we connect students to members of the ocean science community, providing opportunities for them to have in-depth interactions. We host a yearly professional development webinar series for our coaches, and typically we'll highlight um, the current research related to our yearly theme. So for example, in 2022, we focused on climate change, uh, ocean science and solutions, and we focused less on the doom and gloom of climate change that students hear every year, um, and highlighted the many nature and ocean-based solutions such as blue carbon ecosystems and ocean-based renewable energy hoping that we would inspire both the teachers and the students to consider methods and technologies that would help, that they could study in the future to help um, mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. We also focus a lot on getting kids out into the field. We want them to get their feet and their hands wet. Uh, so we do this through field trips and award trips. Activities can include, you know, fun activities like kayaking and sailing, uh, but they may also do uh, community science with beach grass restoration or beach cleanups. Um, they also build and test ROVs, and they may go out on an oceanographic vessel and collect some data. And we also like to support our students who are interested in pursuing a career in ocean science, so we have a yearly scholarship program. So basically, no matter whether the students go into a STEM career or not, our goal is simply to create ocean literate uh, community who understands the importance of the ocean in their lives and the choices that they make. So you may say, why is all this important? Well, a 2018 study showed that fewer than half of US public schools offer any type of environmental or even earth science course. So a lot of students aren't having any exposure to or opportunity to study ocean sciences as part of their formal in-class coursework. And I think we all can agree that that's a real shame because the ocean is ideal for teaching STEM. Uh, it's by nature interdisciplinary and it's not just theoretical has real world applications that can spark students' interest. And we also know that studying and working in the ocean environment poses a lot of challenges uh, that stimulate technological innovation. And that's something that um, our country needs. So the NOSB um, can be one of the only ways that many high school students are being exposed to the ocean sciences and careers in the field. Next slide. So our largest impact in the program is at our regional level. We have 25 regional bowls across the United States. Most of them are hosted by um, universities, but we have some zoos and aquariums and other nonprofits. And there's a regional coordinator at each of those sites that plans uh, that individual bowl. And you can see some states that are very large may have multiple bowls like um, in California. And you can see that we have pretty good representation along the coast, as you would expect, given its focus on ocean science. But we do have two Great Lakes based bowls in Michigan and Wisconsin, and we have the Trout Bowl in Landlock, Colorado. So each of the competitions follows the same basic rules and format, um, and it's a buzzer competition, you know, buzzing in like you see on Jeopardy. Um, but then they also have team challenge worksheets that they have to fill out as a team that where they have to decipher and interpret plots and data in order to answer some questions. And they get competition questions on every topic you can imagine as it's related to ocean science and freshwater science. And while each of these regional bowls follows the same basic format, we do say, hey, you know, come in and, and add some specific flair uh, to your competition. So they may have um, mentoring events, special speakers, campus tours, hands-on activities, chances to meet with graduate students, 
overnight stays at the aquarium, which are kind of cool, um, art contests and research presentations. And then after all 25 bowls take place, the first place team from each regional competition then advances to the national finals where they get to compete again to see who are going to be our national champions. And when they come to the finals competition, that's an all expense paid trip that includes obviously more competition, um, a day of field trips, a congressional mock congressional briefing activity, uh, more career mentoring events, um, an opening ceremony and time for them to uh, meet and have some peer to peer interaction. Next slide, please. So as Jill noted, uh, we all know that evaluation is important and the NOSB has had an ongoing external longitudinal study of our past participants since 2000. And those um, evaluators have been tracking the impact of the program on our past participants, uh, college and professional careers, you know, where they ended up in a career and how the NOSB helped them get there. So you can see um, by the data on the slide that the NOSB has had a positive impact on encouraging its participants to choose degrees and enter careers focused on marine, ocean, or aquatic sciences. And we've also, um, had participants say that they benefited from their participation in having broader perspectives about science and the environment, you know, enhancing their science skills and gaining better knowledge about areas of study and future careers. Next slide. We also do, um, oh, go back one more, please. There we go. We also do uh, post event surveys uh, managed by the national office. And that's, you know, mostly to get to like, what was your experience this year? But we also do specifically ask students and coaches about the impacts the NOSB participation has had on their learning, their interest in ocean science and STEM and their future college and career choices. Responses to a recent uh, student survey show that the NOSB is having a positive impact on students' interest in science, their consideration of careers in scientific fields, including ocean sciences, and being aware of the wealth of ocean science career options. Responses to a coach survey uh, highlighted the impacts that their participation has had on the students um, that compete on their team, but also in their school and their classroom. So anecdotally, we've heard that, you know, at least 33 schools after participating um, have decided to create an ocean science course because of the students' interest in the topic. And we also know that teachers are infusing marine science content into their classrooms, even if they don't have an ocean science course, uh, they can incorporate it into their biology, physics, and chemistry classes. And we also know that the coaches are saying that there's an increase um, in interest in science in their non-NOSB students. Next slide. Okay, so to get into a little bit of the NOSB's focus on diversity initiatives, from the beginning, these are our four program goals. And the third goal has always been to encourage and support the involvement of underrepresented and geographically diverse communities in the ocean sciences. Next slide. So in the early years, uh, prior to me starting with the NOSB, um, regional hosts were encouraged in their recruitment efforts to also specifically recruit teams from underserved and high poverty communities to create a greater um, ocean literacy in communities and encourage more students, especially those underrepresented in STEM, to explore ocean and freshwater science as a career choice. At one point, we did have dedicated funding through a federal award, and that funding was provided to our bowls in Alaska, Hawaii, South Carolina, Wisconsin, California, and Mississippi. And the funds were to help um, cover the cost of teams traveling extremely far distances to compete or those that needed financial assistance to participate, even if the bowl, um, or even if their school was near the bowl location. And to ensure that these teams were not um, discouraged right away by losing to teams that have been competing for years, they basically created JV divisions um, for each of the bowls and all those new diversity initiative teams um, competed in that JV version, and they had their own prizes, their own awards, their own recognition, 
but they put them in the JV division until they felt they were comfortable with both the science content and the competition rules to move up to the so-called level, you know, varsity level competition. They were also provided a lot of additional resources such as textbooks. Um, they were loaned buzzers to, to practice with and obviously lots of sample questions. And most of those bowls um, in these early diversity initiative um, years incorporated tours or activities for those teams. Um, they wanted those teams to see the science that they were learning put to real use and in a real world context. Unfortunately, while the program started to see a lot of real benefits in engaging students underserved uh, in underserved communities through this work and funding, um, that dedicated funding ended in 2011. Next slide. So we still had, you know, this goal to work on this. And in 2014, we did secure some funding from Shell and they wanted to do a specific focus on our hurricane bowl um, hosted by the University of Southern Mississippi. Obviously they had a great interest in the Gulf of Mexico and they had a lot of employees in that region who could also um, volunteer and support the hurricane bowl. So the hurricane bowl had initially recruited five diversity initiative teams in 2010. Um, and with this funding specifically from Shell, they were able to re-recruit them as well as two additional teams. And so out of those seven uh, teams, six were from Mississippi and one was from Tennessee. And on average, they had 25 to 55% non-Caucasian student populations and ranged from 41 to 72% free or reduced lunch. So again, um, this funding was to provide the regional coordinator more time and resources to put towards um, engaging these diversity initiative teams. And that basically broke down to really assisting the teachers with recruitment, um, teaching the students what the NOSB was about, you know, getting students engaged and involved, um, and then obviously preparing them for the competition. So they provided them team development support through webinars. Those webinars would cover the basics of um, what is the format? What is the competition? What can you expect day of? You know, obviously strategies for studying and preparing best practices. Uh, sample questions and going over all the different types of questions that they might encounter during the competition, and then our lengthy competition rules. They also provided um, preparation materials, again, textbooks. Uh, most of these teachers did not have an ocean science textbook, so providing them with quite a few uh, lists of websites that are helpful, reports, again, giving them buzzer systems to practice with and practice questions. Probably one of the most um, influential parts of this uh, initiative was that the RCs did go, sorry, regional coordinators, just in case I didn't say that before, um, would actually do in-person visits to the schools and assist them with these trainings, anything the students needed help with. And a lot of times during those visits, they would do a mock competition again, so the students could understand the format and the rules. They also were lucky that, um, USM has a great marine lab right there on the water. They invited the teams to their marine labs, got those students out on boats, toured the labs, and met with undergrad and graduate students. And I just have to note here that through everything the NOSB has learned over its 25 plus years of being in existence, um, the high school students really gravitate towards the undergraduate and graduate level students. They see themselves. It's not so far of a leap to see themselves in that position in a couple of years. Um, versus thinking about maybe somebody who's at the pinnacle of their career. Um, so we definitely encourage and in, um, incorporate undergraduate and graduate graduate students into all of our regional competitions. And obviously one of the things that made a lot of impact was making sure that their participation was at no cost to any of the students or the teachers or the schools. Um, and then also providing a small stipend to cover costs that were maybe unexpected with either travel or participation. participation. Excuse me, next slide. So the impacts um, overall, since the beginning of the program, um, diversity of our participants has increased over at least the past 12 years. We have, this is all voluntary reporting, self-reporting again, um, as Jill mentioned, um, but our reporting has shown that the um, increase in the participation of non-Caucasian students has gone from 19% to as high as 36%. And we see our largest increases within Asian American and multiracial students. And I guess I have to note that um, 
Asian American students are not categorized as underrepresented by NSFs, NSFs uh, STEM fields, but um, they are underrepresented in the geosciences. In terms of impacts with the specific diversity initiative at the Hurricane Bowl, um, they were able to continue um, engaging those seven schools that they recruited in 2014 all the way through 2017. Um, and during that time, one school, East Union Attendance Center, decided to offer a marine biology class that is still going to this day. Um, the teams that you know originally went in in 2014 in the JV division all moved to the formal varsity competition in 2017, and Oxford High School came in first, um, which was fantastic, really obviously buoyed their um, confidence. And when they competed at finals, they came in eighth, and that was actually the highest um, a team from the Hurricane Bowl had ever placed at finals. Bay High School also came in second that year in 2017. And longer term, majority of these schools are continuing to compete um, in the Hurricane Bowl and have done so through 2022. Next slide, please. I thought I would at least focus a little bit on some of the lessons learned from the NOSP, NOSB's um, diversity initiatives over the years. Um, I don't think it comes as a surprise for me to have that first bullet listed as, you know, it requires consistent dedicated funding. That has been the NOSB's largest barrier to continuing our diversity initiatives. Um, it's often, you know, funders will come in for a few years and then trickle out or the funding suddenly ends. And we certainly don't want our regional co coordinators to be trying to do more with less. We wanna support them in all of their efforts. So um, NOSB knows that we can do better. Um, in terms of the diversity of our students, and we continue to look for opportunities and funding uh, to consistently have more diversity initiatives offered. Um, also, it takes a lot of dedicated time to build these relationships, which is why the funding is important. Um, often we need to fund our regional coordinators early um, so that they can start building these relationships way before most of our regional bowls would be trying to do a recruitment of teams and getting them registered for the competitions. One of the things we found that has worked really well has been engaging that school teacher students, say maybe even six months to a year in advance. One of the best things that we can do is get them to come view a competition before they jump in as competitors. That way they know exactly what's expected of them and they can see the strategies of other teams and meet other teams and their peers um, while they're watching the competition. We also say to start small and build the knowledge when the students are ready. We have a lot of information to provide those students on, you know, how to form a team, how to prepare, how to study, here are the rules. It's a lot for them to remember. So making sure that you split each of those into its own distinct sort of training and only moving on when the students say that they are ready. Obviously providing teachers resources is really important. You can't um, expect them to have everything and anything they might need in order to participate. So making sure that they have the textbooks, making sure that they have the curriculum to use in their class and you know connecting them with experts who might be able to help them with questions about you know specific ocean science topics or the competition rules and really the biggest thing is just making sure that you the person who's like their main contact are available for them providing hands-on and experiential opportunities this is where the NOSB has seen the most impact with all students not just those who have been um, encouraged to participate through our diversity initiatives really getting kids out in the water, letting them see hands on um, how all of this that they're they're studying um, is put into like real world context. Obviously, we suggest that you always engage the teachers in those. A lot of times the um, teams coming in from underserved communities in our diversity initiatives, the teachers and the students are basically co-learners at a time, right? So having the teacher be part of these activities is extremely helpful. And if you can, getting the families involved is even better because if the family sees um, the impact of participating in this program on their child, they're more likely to support them, but also to help try to remove any barriers from um, their schedules and to ensure that the student can participate. And if you can make it personal to their region, that's also fantastic. So what is the topic of concern in your region? Is it storm surge? Is it nuisance flooding? Is it harmful algal blooms? Again, if the students can take what they're learning in their studying for NOSB and then also see that hands-on, 
um, when they're out on a boat or out on the beach. Um, obviously, it's a much stronger learning opportunity. We always say use your networks. Uh, we know any work in diversity is awfully often unfunded and it's a, a lot more difficult, takes a lot more time. So as much as you can, use those around you, use your science uh, experts, especially if you're at a university, you've got a wealth of uh, professors and graduate students um, who I'm sure are willing to help you with activities, resources, or serving as mentors. Also asking your program participants to assist. NOSB has a large number of coaches who have been in the program for 10 plus years, plus all of our alumni. Nine times out of 10, if you simply ask them to assist, they're more than more than willing to be helpful, whether it's preparing a team, going over the rules, helping them with the science mentorship, whatever it is, you can probably find somebody to assist you. Reducing the cost of participation is probably the number one thing I can always suggest. Um, and that includes the registration, transportation, lodging, and meals. We've actually heard from a lot of our um, diversity initiative coaches that providing meals, it seems so simple, but that is one of the ways that, um, one of the reasons our schools will allow them to participate in an after school or weekend activity. Um, and when we're talking about that, trying to get um, the required school paperwork in early, work with that teacher. As we all know, every school district is different in their rules and regulations, but many are now asking teachers to have their plans um, submitted six, three to six months in advance of any activity that might happen outside of school. So working with that teacher early to make sure that they can get everything submitted on their end so that um, if they wish to participate and they're able to do so at the time of your competition, they are able. Also accepting that you might have to adjust your typical modes of communication. Um, we have learned it might be that they want, it really it's, it's working with them one-on-one -on -one with that team, what kind of communication they want, what are the formats they want, are emails okay? Do you need phone calls? Do you need to provide emails to the parents as well? Um, our Southern Stingray Bowl in Savannah, Georgia has found that a lot of the students actually want text messages, right? So um, you might have to think about sharing the information in a different mode than you would with your teams that have been participating for you know, 10 plus years. And also remaining flexible with deadlines. We know when we are working with, excuse me, with teams from underserved communities, they have a lot more going on in their lives sometimes. It might be that that student, um, you know, both parents work and they are the child care provider, or maybe that student actually has to have an after school job to help contribute to the budget. That's going to put extra constraints on them. Um, so we often talk about building your timelines for the competition where you can remain flexible. So for example, for the NOSB, if one of these teams were to show up the day of with only two out of the required four students, still let them compete. Just, you know, they don't meet the, the basic requirements so they can't move on to win the competition, but still involve them in the competition. Let them compete, let them participate in all the other activities. Um, and so remaining flexible like that as much as you can ensures that you at least get some participation even if something goes wrong on the day of. Next slide. Just really quick. Um, so I mentioned that you know that official the initial funding for diversity initiatives ran out in 2011, and then our shell funding ran out in 2017. But that doesn't mean that we aren't currently still looking for ways um, to have a focus on diversity within the NOSB. Currently, we have um, on our STEM funding, and we're doing a, a pilot project where we are posting assignments on ScoutLiar. So ScoutLiar is a Navy supported platform and it's used by many schools with underrepresented and military connected student populations. And the teacher can go in and assign their students um, assignments and activities to do either in the classroom or outside of the classroom. The nice thing is ScoutLiar can be used basically on any device and even when internet is limited. And so we've been using our competition questions. We've been posting 10 question quizzes. Um, we've been using our theme resources to have the students explore a theme and talk about the science behind it, but also maybe the career opportunities within that topic, such as, you know, how does how do oceans impact weather? What are resilient coastal communities? Uh, what's the impact of ocean acidification? And the nice thing with these is the assignments can be used as is, as we post them, or the teachers can go in and adapt them so that they can use them in their classroom as they see fit. And this is also nice for us because we're reaching a different demographic than our traditional schools that are competing in the NOSB. Lastly, we are also um, currently working on a large NOSB programmatic needs assessment. 
So the NOSB has been around for 25 plus years um, and it's always sort of remained in its current quiz bowl format without any major changes. So uh, we know the broad goals of the NOSB are still relevant and important, but we know that ocean literacy needs have changed and education needs have changed over the past 25 years. Um, so we're looking at, you know, the format of our competition, um, what we offer, is it still the most impactful for students learning opportunities? And are we, are we still helping our sponsors meet their current priorities for education and workforce development? So um, as part of that, um, there is going to be a greater focus on underserved populations. What is it that the NOSB needs to know about current barriers um, and how we can remove those barriers for participants who are coming from underserved communities? You know, what distinct needs might those students and teachers have? Um, there may be some that we've never considered um, and we haven't previously incorporated into the competition or the overall program. So those are two things that we're currently working on uh, right now. Next slide. And I just wanted to say, if this is something that you are interested in, um, there are ways to participate in our needs assessment, especially with this focus on uh, engaging more students from underserved areas. So if you're interested in that, please reach out and let me know. Um, and also, you know, we always need volunteers every year. So if there, if this presentation, you know, piqued your interest, um, let me know. We can find how to get you connected to a regional competition to serve as a volunteer. And if you're going to be at N NMEA next year or this uh, next week, sorry, next week, we will be there with a poster about our needs assessment. So come by and say hello to us. So happy to answer any questions now and feel free to email me if you'd like any more additional information. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and before we, okay, before we go do, I did check with Jill in the chat, but I didn't want to chat while you were talking. Are you okay staying on a few more minutes? Yes. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, so, so thank you. Um, Jill and Melissa agreed to stay on, so we'll stay in um, open session and take a few questions. Um, the first one is Jean. Good afternoon, Jean May Brett. I am a member of the committee, um, white female, pronouns are she and her, retired from the Louisiana Department of Education. Um, and I actually have questions for both of you, so I'll, I'll ask a couple and then stop, Kelly, and then we'll go back and forth. Um, and actually, the first one I want to ask is to both Jill and Melissa, and I thank both of you sincerely for your presentations. I've had opportunity to cross paths with the programs at different times. Um, I know the great value of competition, whether it's athletic or academic. I have done academic games. I coach basketball. I have, you know, tremendous uh, opportunities. If I go to FIRST Robotics and VEX Robotics, or if I've been to Sea Perch, it's inspirational. And like uh, they had the Hurricane Bowl for many years, Melissa, I almost put one of my Hurricane Bowl shirts on. Uh, just because there's a few of them in the drawer and I could use them very quickly. However, when we begin talking about competition, sometimes it is by nature exclusive rather than inclusive. And that could be because of the resources available to particular schools. Um, you know, Jill, you made the comment of greater than 32% high poverty. I didn't know if that included the worldwide competition or your US teams, because that would be very different. So I, I wonder if you can speak to this idea of how we make sure that programs like yours truly reach high poverty areas because one of the questions we have in our work that we're doing is we don't have K-12 students actually understanding what opportunities are there and we lose talent. It simply disappears. 7,000 high school students drop out each week. And as you yourself have pointed out, we have a situation where less than half of the US schools actually have environmental and earth science. So just if you could speak a little bit to that idea of how your programs are working to make sure we get the high poverty inclusive students into them. Sure, I'll, I'll 
start and um, great question and thank you. And I should have pointed out, yeah, that high poverty um, data point is based on US because it ties into US census data and some definitions about high poverty areas in the US. So it was specific to the US. Um, first, I want to address your uh, comment about competition. And yes, we hear this all the time. I'm sure Melissa does, right? Competition that has such a negative connotation. Um, one of the things I think that it really uh, stems from or comes from the top are the culture, the vibe, the message that we give. It is a competition, but it's about collaboration. We are a community of learners. And to your point, Jean, it's going to take all of us, all of us working together, collaborating, sharing ideas, working together, a broad, diverse group community of, of global learners to solve the, the problems that we face today and address environmental issues, societal issues. So I really feel um, a lot of that for us comes from the tone that we set. It is a competition, but if you come to our events, and George can back me up here, it is about collaborating. We have teams sharing ideas, sharing parts and pieces, helping each other out. And we also um, more recently took a nod from FIRST and VEX, and we have incorporated the last day of our competition at the World Championship. It's a collaborative mission. And it's students, teams working together. And I get chills when I think about teams sharing robots, sharing pilots, sharing resources, really working collaborati to collaboratively to accomplish a task and they all get points, right? It, a rising tide lifts all boats. And with this collaborative mission, they get individual points, but for the more of the task that's completed, they all benefit. So I think that's ways that you can, again, the tone that you set from the leadership about collaborating, working together, sharing ideas, we're all in this together, we're all finding solutions to these problems. And then um, I know that our collaborative mission, we implemented that in 2018, I believe, has had a huge impact. Um, to uh, address your question about how we are getting resources to these high poverty areas, I have to give a nod to the Schmidt Ocean Coalition for that. Um, we have resources from them. And I give a nod to NSF, Lisa, not, not to you and NSF. Over the course of our existence, we have had grants that allow us to provide CMATE ROV starter kits to groups and to, and to provide resources, tooling to help classrooms set up. And we partner with like-minded organizations. That gets back to my last point. It's, it's not always funding is good. There's no doubt about that. But if we can find an organization, for example, um, we're working with an organization in Louisiana. I know you said you were from Louisiana, and I'm going to get this wrong. Um, it is... Um, it's a black lawyers group in, um, you probably are familiar with it, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name because it's been a recent partnership that was facilitated by one of our longtime volunteers who's from Louisiana, but they work with, um, you know, at risk, high risk, impoverished um, African American students, the whole gamut in, I think it's Terrebonne Parish, I, I my days at LSU have, 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 have it's been a while, um, but they are working with those groups to show them, um, to help them develop skills and show them different pathways and different job opportunities. And so working with them, we've been able to, with this grant funding, Schmidt Ocean Coalition, provide them with kits that they can then use in their programming with these students. So it's really, I guess, um, partnerships, finances, and really relying on our, our partners, our RCs. Melissa, we call our regional coordinators RCs as well. Our regional coordinators and our volunteers and all of the people that are part of this community are really our ambassadors. And we rely on them and ask them, you know, identify groups in your area that need this support. And then let's work together. Let's find the funding. Let's find these partnerships to provide these materials. So, um, I hope that I got all of your questions. It was really insightful that that you asked, and I appreciate those questions. And before I turn it over to Melissa, um, I'm going to share. You know, 
I shared the in the chat, I'm going to put a link to our impact report. I highlighted our alumni survey in my presentation, but an impact report, you can see a summary of our post competition surveys and it has to be updated. We just finished the 2024 season. It's going to be updated with 2024 data, but you can see similar questions that Melissa um, and NOSB ask about student interest in STEM learning and all of that. Uh, take a look at that. So thanks, Jean, for that question. Yeah, I think I would probably second so much of what Jill just said about the community um, and, and utilizing your communities. Uh, we have the 25 regional competitions across the U.S. and each of those regional coordinators obviously has different um, methods for reaching out to you know schools to um, engage them in the competition. But one of the things that we've been suggesting is reaching out to their teachers who are currently involved, um, who are already field teams. They often have a lot of information um, about the demographics of schools in their areas. Um, and like I said, they are willing to assist. They are willing to help bring those teams into the competition and sharing the knowledge that they've gained for say the past um, 10 plus years. So I would say it's definitely a lot of uh, community building at the regional level. Um, but I also think, you know, as I said, remaining adaptive um, and accepting of what those teams and schools from those underserved dis uh, disadvantaged areas, how they can participate. So it may be that you put a lot of effort and time into getting them into the competition, but they literally don't come to the competition. But that doesn't mean that the work that you've done isn't worthwhile. You got them you know, into the field, maybe doing collecting some data. You know, They got to meet a graduate student or they came and they saw the lab or they came to an event where they got to meet you know, their peers. Um, just because they didn't compete doesn't mean that it was a failure um, on your end to, to engage them in the competition. Um, so I think just, like I said, trying to <laughs> find out their individual needs as much as possible um, and incorporate what they need into the, their training. Because the teams have been around for you know 10 plus years, they've got it down. Those, those teachers know exactly what they need to do every year, um, but you know, giving yourself the time to work one-on-one -on -one with those other coaches that are new um, is gonna be helpful. I'd like to, thank you both. Um, I'd like to go a little bit further if you don't mind. Um, Jill, you showed us the, the graph and very definitely COVID hit and hurt a great deal. Um, Melissa, um, what happened um, or where do you stand? You had 25 regionals. Last year, there were what, 17? Um, uh, what, what is the plan for the coming year? Have you been able to rebuild? Jill was showing those kind of efforts. Um, you know, we were looking for what kind of message we can give to K-12 communities that increases the diversity in our ocean studies. Um, and so if COVID hit, what kinds of things have to happen now? Well, I will say uh, one of the things that I, I think was really interesting um, is that we did find that students were not particularly interested in doing anything virtually. Um, I think if we had tried virtual competition years previously, maybe it would have worked. Um, but after COVID hit and students were forced to do everything virtually, that is something that they uh, were not interested in. So um, our 2020, 21, and 22 competitions were all virtual, and we did see some drop off each year, um, simply because students were like, I don't want to do anything online anymore, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, they, they would do the competition, but they necessarily weren't coming to the uh, presentations and the virtual tours and, and all of that. Um, so I will say for us, it has been trying to get back to in-person competitions. So um, as you as you might know, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which housed the NOSB, um, you know, starting in 1997, um, was dissolved, and uh, we moved over to the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. That move created some difficulty with getting our funding moved over, so we didn't have competitions in 2023. Uh, last year, yes, we supported the regional competitions with our seed or the seed funding that we usually provide them, and we had 17 come back, um, and a lot of the those that didn't hold a competition, some of them like Hawaii were still facing um, issues regarding weird regulations because of COVID and how students in specific school districts could participate. 
others had a lot of in, internal internal turmoil um, and changes going on. So there were only a few um, that couldn't be held because of um, the amount of funding we provided. We actually did find that the other issue with COVID, um, a lot of our longtime coaches, a lot of these teachers left, left the schools. Um, after COVID, they did not want to be in formal classroom um, anymore. They were looking for informal or other job opportunities. They just wanted to get out. So we did lose a lot of our longtime coaches, which meant that some regions um, couldn't necessarily uh, recruit as many teams as they would want for a typical competition year. So we are rebuilding. Um, we're supporting our regional competitions again in 2025. Uh, we're in discussions with them right now. We hope to have by September um, all their chosen dates um, up on our website and can inform people of like which competitions are happening. I'm hoping that we'll have at least the same 17 as last year, um, if not the full 25. Uh, one of the other re issues we've just run into a lot is that we had, um, as you can imagine with a program that's been around for 25 plus years, a lot of those regional coordinators ran their bowl for 20 plus years and now they're retiring. Um, so trying to find somebody at that host institution to serve in that role or trying to switch over to a new institution as a host has been um, a little problematic, but um, we're working on that over the summer. Like I said, I hope we have everything up and ready uh, to disseminate to everyone um, in September. Um, and we are planning for at least a virtual finals. Um, and depending on how, how much funding we can raise, uh, we hope to do an in-person for even if it's augmented for say eight out of the 25 teams. Um, so that is our plan currently. Okay, I'd like to just validate some of the things Melissa said. Um, yes, Melissa, we we tried virtual. We had our, our in-person and telepresence, quote unquote, because it wasn't true telepresence competition as we were coming out of the pandemic. And we did that a couple of years and no, people wanted to be there in person. It was not, were, people were tired of being virtual, tired of being online and wanted to get back to in-person. And I also appreciate what you described when I, when I mentioned that we're building back and it's slowly and there's other factors contributing to that. Certainly all that you said, teachers have moved on, teachers have retired, volunteers. We call it the COVID hole because in some cases for us, and I'll give a, an example local to George and I here on the central coast of California, we had Aptos High School, amazing team. They had a advanced competition team, advanced competition class team, a middle one and a beginner team. Uh, during the pandemic, the advanced team moved on and there was no additional schooling, professional development, learning. And so that team that was in the middle continued to be stuck in the middle and then moved on. So we've got this this lag, right, as we we reinstate and people get back going. And I think for us, when it comes to our regional events, we have 48 regional programs. They are not all back online, you know, as one of our board members described it. 2020, all those candles that it took us 20 years to light, they all were extinguished. And so it's not going to take, it's going to take longer than just one year to bring them back online. But we've uh, we've looked at and, and sort of applied this strategy where we're looking at our regional events and basically establishing some criteria. Do we still have an active regional coordinator? Do we still have an active engaged entity? Do we have volunteer support? Yes. So what help do they need to bring them back online? And we are deploying people, personnel. We've got a number of people that will go, go forth with our kits supported by these grants to do professional development workshops, which is a cornerstone and a key starting point for team development um, and, and supporting that effort to bring them all back online. It's, it's, it's going to take a while. I, I had hoped, right, by this time we'd be back up to those pre-pandemic numbers. That's not the reality as you dig into it and look at all these other issues and other impacts. Um, I think it'll take us probably two more years at least to get everything back online and back up to 48 events and, and our pre-pandemic numbers. I thank you both because you touched on something that I wanted to make sure was stated, and that is the importance of the teacher touch. If you don't have the mentors, if you don't have the teachers to continue the programs, then I appreciate the fact that both your programs have professional development to help along the way. And Jill, I'd ask you one more question, if you don't mind. Going in the K-12, as you look at your middle school and your high school, 
do you find people who have had the mate experience in middle school looking to continue in high school? And when they finish in high school, are they go going to universities that they come in contact with through the mate experience that have the program at the college level also? In other words, have you got a kind of pathway for those students? Yes, short answer is yes. And, and detailed, so our competition, I didn't get into these details, but we have five different competition classes all under one umbrella. That's where we're a little different than a VEX or a FIRST. Um, we have Scout, Navigator, Ranger, Pioneer, and Explorer. And we set it up purposefully, this progression of competition classes, this progression of learning. So ideally, we get a student involved in, say, upper elementary. They get excited. They move on to middle school where they continue with us. They move on to high school. They move on to college and university and then out into the workforce. And with the longitudinal data that we have, we absolutely have evidence of that. And some of my favorite examples are a student started in middle school, went to high school, joined the MATE team, went on to Purdue University. There was no MATE team at Purdue University, so we started one. And he set up this plan, the succession plan. Purdue is now one of our longer running teams, very robust. It's institutionalized there. So it's really rewarding, Jean, to see that progress. And then to your point, to make those connections, right? That's our job. We're, we're conveners and connectors, myself, our headquarters staff and our regional coordinators to make those connections. You don't have a mate team at your middle school, let's find you one. Let's find a group of individuals. Let's find a mentor, a volunteer mentor. Let's put a team together. It doesn't have to be in the school. It can be out of school. Um, that's where those others come in. So yeah, that's what we're about. And that's actually the most fun and rewarding part of, of what I do, my job. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your presentations. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks for the excellent questions as well. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Are there any last questions before we let our gracious guests go? <laughs> okay. I don't see anything else. Um, Jill and Melissa, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic conversation. I know I learned a whole lot and I, I know the committee did too. Um, if we have any questions, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll uh, send out an email. Um, but just again, thank you so much for, for taking the time to prepare and to be here today. Um, this was really, really helpful for the committee. Um, so thank you. Um, so that closes our, uh, our public session. Um, we, if you're a committee member on the line, I'm going to put the link in the, in the chat. Um, if you can join the, the closed committee link, um, we'll go uh, into the next part of our meeting. So thank you all.